Good afternoon, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1 p.m., beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads, and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary, and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of those newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, for companies, and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, offering desk space, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And we're a safe space for artists to take risk in their, risks in their practice and to make time for collaboration. This week's talk is by Rob Eagle, and it's called Making Through Failing. Rob is an interdisciplinary artist and PhD researcher at UWE Bristol's Digital Cultures Research Centre. He'll be talking about how failure can open up opportunities for us to live non-normative lifestyles and to create work that is true to who we are and how we see the world. There'll be a Q&A at the end, and the talk runs at roughly 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat window. I'll pick them out to ask Rob. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. There'll be a captioned version of this talk available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, next week's talk is by studio resident Sharon Clark, the creative director of Raucus, which is a collective of theatre makers, technologists and designers. She'll be talking about how the pandemic has changed how we think of theatre, some of the ideas that Raucus have been testing, and how this is going to influence the work they make in the future. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share the link now on any of your socials. For now, I'm going to hand over to Rob. Hello, thanks for that introduction. Um, if you're anything like me, you grew up with aphorisms like if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, this romantic sentiment that even if you fail, you'll come back stronger. I'm reminded of the current mantra, build back better, that we're hearing in the UK and the US. Do you ever just think, give me a break? Well, if at first you don't succeed, failure may be your style. This from the unapologetically queer Quentin Crisp, someone who refused to be normal or to fit in. He celebrated his failure to conform to social acceptability. Now these days, artists and academics have to think about their individual brand. You know, social media, LinkedIn, personal websites. These are all forms of individual marketing where we trumpet our successes. But how do we record and reflect on failure? How many times have failures been erased because the project didn't make money or didn't move beyond the prototype stage? In a world where we're often ashamed of not succeeding, what I'm gonna to do today is bring failure out of the closet and look at it as a strategy for making and living. I'm also arguing for us to rethink our individualistic models for success and failure against this backdrop of individual competition for arts grants and this neoliberal economic interest invading academia, I'm proposing that we reject the system and set of metrics that praises just the individual. Through failing to abide by this cult of the commercially success, successful individual artist or auteur, we find lo-fi solutions, collegiality, and collective action that produce meaningful change in our work. So what do I mean by failure? It can come in many forms. So I have adapted my concept from the queer theorist, Jack Halberstam. Losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, not knowing. 
may in fact offer more creative, more cooperative, more surprising ways of being in the world. I have made dozens of documentary films over the past 15 years. Some of them I'm proud of, and some of them I'd rather forget. Since 2015, I've been working with immersive media. I started filming with 360 cameras uh, and began working with virtual reality. So uh, a VR headset looks like this. This is the Oculus Rift or Oculus Quest, and it provides uh, 360 visuals all around. But my PhD practice, which I'll be talking about later, uses an augmented, re augmented reality headset. Um, so this is the HoloLens. Um, it projects um, what look like uh, holograms uh, into the space in front of you. So just so that you know what sort of technology uh, I'm referring to. In 2019, I developed an AR installation called Through the Wardrobe through a UK-wide funding scheme for immersive media prototypes. So uh, here is a photo of me standing uh, in my installation at the Barbican in London. We did all our R&D in the spring of 2019, front of potential funders, distributors, and venues in October of 2019. Everyone got up there and presented the great successes of their projects. But what I found more interesting were a few prototypes where the makers told me in private that their R&D completely failed. Or to be more exact, they conducted their R&D, built prototypes, and then realized that the technology doesn't deliver what they'd like it to, or simply that what they want to do is simply is too expensive, and no one can drum up half a million quid for a niche VR project these days. But these felt like secret confessions. The makers of failed projects felt like they had to get up in front of a room full of funders, curators, and peers, and project this image of success. Failure was ignored because it was too shameful to discuss publicly. So based on Jack Halberstam's interpretation of failure, I'm gonna divide the rest of this talk into four main themes. Forgetting, uh, losing, forgetting, undoing, and collective action. So let me start first with losing and getting lost. In 2006, I did an, M an MA in ethnographic documentary filmmaking. Uh, I learned how to make meaningful, earnest documentaries, work that I was really proud of. And when I graduated, I was going to make films that were going to change the world. And then I moved to London and started working in TV. As an immigrant and in an expensive city, I had to take any jobs I could just to pay my rent. I worked on some atrocious, atrocious shows, um, often uh, because often taking huge creative risks is reserved for the privileged. Those who don't have to worry about becoming homeless are being deported if they can't pay their bills. I looked at all the white middle-class people working in TV, and you can say a lot for a lot of the same for the arts in this country. And I saw people who are able to live at home uh, and be supported by their parents. Their creative uh, ventures could be subsidized, but some of us don't have that privilege. So after two years, I honestly felt like I had lost my way as a filmmaker and as an artist. I did what any struggling artist uh, would do to survive. I looked for security. So I found a permanent job that I worked at for eight years, making short films for university. I needed that stability. But I stopped taking big creative risks. In fact, I became creatively lazy and my work became formulaic. I resisted quitting my job to go off and take risks in my filmmaking because I was terrified of, of failing. In finding security, I had lost my artistic voice. Gradually, over my last few years in London, from 2014 onwards, I started to push myself. I started doing drag and failed miserably, but at least I opened up parts of myself I didn't know were there. I started making my own films about queer communities, 
making 360 films in inspired me to move to Bristol to start this PhD, working with immersive media. I've had a monthly stipend for my PhD, so I know that I've been very fortunate and very privileged in that. So I, had, I don't have to worry about paying the rent. Finding myself in Bristol and a community of queers, academics and artists, and even queer academic artists, helped me lose my fear in taking risks. My practice has flourished as I've made work in media from AR to audio to film. In September 2017, Dr. Joao Florencio, a uh, lecturer at the University of Exeter, approached me and asked if I wanted to direct a film with him as producer about his research, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. We would be filming in clubs and dark rooms in Berlin, looking at the celebration of sexuality of gay men today in Europe and America, where HIV is not the death sentence that it was for the generation before. Of course, access to HIV antivirals to everyone uh, is not uh, equal to everyone, uh, but still medical advances have changed behaviors and attitudes for, uh, for many gay men these days. So Joao and I spent uh, two and a half years planning what we hoped would be this feature length observational documentary. We were gonna shoot the film over two months in Berlin. I would balance my PhD obligations with shooting with contributors when they were free. We would film at the weekends and in evenings. So we assembled this lovely team. Joao was producer, Rue the director of photography, Liz the editor, and Liam the composer. They were all involved in the creative process uh, before we even shot anything. I landed in Berlin on the 8th of March last year, and it became apparent very quickly that the film we had envisioned would not happen. Our two month shoot was cut to two weeks. I went through a roller coaster of emotions, feeling like a failure for not delivering on the film that I had promised. Like millions of artists around the world, I had lost the opportunity to realize the project I had spent two years preparing. I needed to give up the whole observational style with crowds and clubs, and I felt lost. With the clock running out, I had to come up with a radically different visual style. So rather than filming in clubs, I propose that we bring the clubs, or at least the feeling of clubs, to us. So any flat can become a club. As a creative team, we made it happen. Joao and I worked with the composer, uh, and that music inspired some of the filming. We spoke with the editor, Liz, every day, and their input shaped how we planned shoots. Joao, uh, Rue, the director of photography, and I became an efficient filming team by the end. And what resulted is a 21 minute film that is, it's now doing the, the rounds at documentary and queer film festivals. And it's entirely different from what I had initially envisioned. Uh, now the actual film uh, contains some uh, explicit language. Um, so I've edited a clip uh, here that gives you a sense of the look and feel um, with, uh, with some music from the film under it. So uh, if we could play the clip, please. So what's the moral of the story of our film in Berlin? I'm still disappointed that we didn't make the film we had planned for two and a half years. We had to give up because we're fighting a global pandemic, which is bigger than us. And yet 
because I had a production team around me. We produced a short film that is far more visually interesting and experimental than the observational style I was going for. Failing, giving up, losing meant that I had to adapt, try something new and take a risk. Joe Biden in his 2008 convention speech, now President Biden, um, shared words of wisdom that he learned from his mother. Failure at some point in your life is inevitable, but giving up is unforgivable. Now, with all due respect, Joe, that's malarkey. Sometimes you have to give up. You have to know when and how to give up because success as you had originally envisioned it is just not an option. In an era of trumpeting success, we always have to pretend uh, like we have our act together, but really we're just holding it all together with a bit of cello tape and a prayer. Forgetting. In the UK, February is LGBT plus history month. There's a host of events on about remembering queer history this month, and there's value in that. The work of historians of sexuality and gender diversity is essential to understanding a queer past that has been neglected, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, by institutions and past generations of historians. I've made a number of films about British queer history for this purpose. But this celebration of a forgotten queer past neglects how some people choose to forget. Sometimes remembering the past is too painful because according to Anne Kvetkovich, trauma can be unspeakable and unrepresentable. And because it is marked by forgetting and dissociation, it often seems to leave behind no records at all. Now, I know that every artist is familiar with that rejection email. It usually goes something along the lines of this. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your application. The standard was really high this time. And while we cannot offer you this opportunity, we hope that you will consider applying again in future, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you do with these rejection emails? You can't obsess over them. That will just fill you with bitterness and regret. Equally, forgetting them or just deleting them feels like you're not acknowledging that you just spent two or three days or a week on that application only to be rejected. And your frustration cannot and should not be let go of so easily. I actually have a folder on my desktop of these letters and dead applications waiting for me to read once I've actually forgotten uh, uh, that pain of rejection. So that choice whether to remember or forget trauma and rejection. Queers can be well versed in rejection, perhaps rejected by family or friends for the sexuality or gender on a daily basis, not fitting into the norms of society. To be queer is to have experience beyond the normative and the acceptable. Many of us grow up trying to, trying really hard to fit in, to be accepted in the club. We police our language and our gestures, our gaze and our desires. Not everyone has the luxury of coming out in their family or society. But for those of us who are able to embrace our queerness, that Yas Queen celebration is coupled with the potential of rejection and violence. So how do we cope? As Anne Kvetkovich observes, by forgetting or letting go. Sometimes severing from a traumatic past is the only way to survive the present and imagine a better future. So don't assume that all queers wanna talk about their trauma. Let's look at the tropes of TV documentaries about trans people. The cisgender gaze of broadcast TV and mainstream journalism focuses on the medicalization and the aesthetic success of passing as a new gender. Every TV documentary loves to film gender confirmation surgeries. This constitutes a literal severing of the past in order to construct a revised body for the future. These documentaries often focus on trauma, such as rejection 
and on gender dysphoria. These films are filled with wistful shots of the dysphoric trans person looking out the, the window very sadly. So this actually leads me to uh, the project that I mentioned at the start, my AR installation, Through the Wardrobe. Through the Wardrobe presents the voices of four genderqueer and non-binary Bristolians. While we acknowledge dysphoria and some trauma, I wanted instead to focus on strategies of, of gender euphoria and feeling good in one's body. I'm tired of documentaries about trans trauma and surgery. So with my four fantastic contributors, we examine the everydayness of getting dressed, of going for a walk, the power of a cup of tea to make you feel good. These mundane activities, of course, help you to reflect. They are these automatic everyday rituals um, that are actually so everyday that they're forgettable most of the time. While TV documentaries like to focus on the sensational life-changing events of surgery and trauma, Through the Wardrobe actually presents the unexceptional, the forgettable qualities of daily self-care. So here we have a clip to give you a sense of what the installation is like. I think I've always known that I was not male. I don't have to wear a skirt to be non-binary. I guess it's kind of a really empowering way to look after yourself. So I know my identity, but my expression is very fluid. Looking in the mirror and feeling like that's still the same person, such an affirming feeling for me. This is who I am, and you can't shut me down. So Through the Wardrobe uh, premiered as a prototype at Sheffield Dockfest in 2019. Um, it then toured to home in Manchester, and it went to the International Documentary Festival Amsterdam. These are some, some photos of it as it was installed in Amsterdam. It then went to the Barbican Gallery in London. And uh, recently in November, 2020, it was publicly exhibited at the Goethe Institute China in Beijing. Undoing an unbecoming success. If you're looking for a good laugh, in my opinion, the funniest show on Netflix is Nailed It. It's a baking show that celebrates failure. In each competition, three entirely incompetent bakers create utterly unedible monstrosities. They're crimes against confection. The hosts do everything they can to ensure the failure of the competitors. It's like the baking equivalent of Takashi's Castle. Everyone fails and no one takes themselves too seriously. But its silly, flippant veneer masks its radical potential as it mimics yet subverts the cliched format of the individualistic competition show. I mean, we, we love a good competition show in Britain, don't we? They take us on these journeys of emotion from the joy of, of watching someone's extraordinary talent to the schadenfreude we feel when ineptitude is punished. Think of X Factor, Britain's Got Talent, the Great British Bake Off and RuPaul's Drag Race. Each to her own, may the best woman win. We love a winner, but we also love the drama, the tears, the meltdowns, because it's not us. But we are also uh, <laughs> terrible singers or bakers, and we can identify with that failure. These shows, as much as we might love them for their harmless entertainment, are constructed out of the spirit of a neoliberal competitive individualism. I don't want to take away the, the pleasure of your guilty, of your TV guilty pleasures. I'm just offering a, a critical reading here. But that's why I love Nailed It. It takes the individual drive and turns it on its head. It refuses an aesthetics of flawless perfection. 
Now let's extend this sort of model to academia and the arts. Think of all those really annoying tweets, and I'm, I'm guilty of this sometimes, those really annoying tweets that uh, are, are something like, I'm delighted to have been granted AHRC or Arts Council funding for my next big project. And it's just so galling when we were passed over. As much as we might be happy for our colleagues, we can't help but be a little bit jealous. It feels like being the last one chosen for the football team in PE class because, well, we just aren't that fit. What happens when you don't have access to the funding and resources? One strategy is accepting outsider status and making work from what you have around you. I love the ethos of American artist Kembra Fowler, who coined the term availabilism. It's this punk ethos of pulling reused and recycled fabrics and objects, including technology, rather than striving after shiny new art materials. When I did drag, and I was, wasn't very good at it, but when I did drag, it was in the spirit of availabilism. So I was trawling charity shops, going through skips, and sewing things badly and using hot glue gun just to, to create things out of what I could find around me without having to buy new stuff. Contrast that to the American RuPaul's Drag Race girls who spend thousands on their outfits. In creative technology, there's hacker culture. The key to innovation is often a lo-fi solution with really clever design. Our very own Martin O'Leary here has an amazing wealth of knowledge for technical making that can be DIY and creative. There is also a book that came out last year on art hack practice that Claire Reddington uh, has a chapter in. Um, it's an examination of the pervasive media studio. What nailed it? Availabilism and hacker culture all have in common is this refusal to measure success only by commercial metrics or aesthetics of perfection. They celebrate getting your hands dirty by doing, not by buying the latest and greatest devices or working with the best materials that money can buy. In the queer theory classic, uh, Cruising Utopia, love this book, um, Jose Esteban Munoz devotes most of chapter 10 to uh, what he calls queer failure, which he defines as this. Queer failure is not so much a failure to succeed as it is a failure to participate in a system of valuation that is predicated on exploitation and conformity. A failure to participate in a system of valuation that is predicated on exploitation and conformity. So Munoz praises a, uh, a messy drag aesthetic and performance, and he refuses to play into this individualistic, profit-driven, uh, neoliberal objective of, of art and, uh, and uh, academia. This is what Halberstam terms unbecoming, resistance to the status quo. Now, there's a, a critic here, uh, Marty, M Mari Ruti, who points out that if failure is just as good, nay better than success, then there does not seem to be much point in agitating for social change of any kind. And that's true. Some of this can be uh, very fatalistic and very nihilistic. Why even try? If you're just going to fail, if you're just going to give up, why even try? Where is the potential? for social change. Surely it's gotta be more than just a bunch of inedible cakes. And this is where you can look at what happened last year here in Bristol. The Black Lives Matter movement and the act of toppling the Colston statue. This was an intervention of undoing and unbecoming, a refusal to carry on with a system that perpetuates institutional and systematic racism from disproportionate numbers of stop and search and incarceration rates of black men in Britain. To the reminder every day that a man who profited from the enslavement of Africans was worth remembering more than the enslaved themselves. That crowd of mostly young people took matters into their own hands and pulled apart a system built on exploitation and racism. Let's not forget in this collective act 
Four people are currently charged with criminal damage for destruction to public property. So what was the, the knock-on effect of all that? All around Bristol, the long-awaited renaming processes of institutions was miraculously sped up, including a, a certain concert hall. And around the UK, more statues came down and more names of the profiteers of slavery were eliminated almost overnight. Unbecoming is this refusal to uphold a system of oppression that given the chance leads to action in the form of, of undoing. And with the way that the constant desire for economic growth at any cost is actually destroying the planet, we as queers, artists, and academics can respond to toxic global systems that we all too e easily feed into quite often. And this leads me to section four, collective action. Here I return to our individualism in the arts and academia. Every AHRC and Arts Council funding call is a fierce competition, each to her own, may the best woman win. The only way to make it through the grueling, lonely application process is optimism, a hope that this time you won't be picked last. The Instagram influencers out there, the mouthpieces of the great new liberal system, tell us that misfortune is a blessing. All these have convinced us that failure is simultaneously shameful, and yet it makes us stronger. This framing, however, places the burden and the onus of failure and the success on the individual. In reality, when your art succeeds, when people are moved by it, you know, laughing, interacting, or immersed in your work, success is shared by you and all who enabled it. And when you fail, that's also shared because you're not alone in your failure. There's a, a brilliant book called Bright Sighted by Barbara Ehrenreich. And it looks at this American habit of positive thinking, that positive, uh, that this belief that success happens to people who think good thoughts. And failure is the result of negative attitude, not structural conditions. You can engineer your own success as long as you put your mind to it. She writes, quote, if optimism is the key to material success, and if you can achieve an optimistic outlook through the discipline of positive thinking, then there is no excuse for failure, end quote. I've seen some of this, this thinking creep into Britain over the last 20 years. As long as you think positive thoughts, you can be a winner. Once you become a millionaire, you can thank capitalism, stock markets, and luck for your success. But if you fail, it's your own fault. You didn't think positively, and you just didn't try hard enough. From Thatcher to Pretty Patel, those in power love to tell us that failure is down to individuals not taking responsibility for themselves. Isn't this the message of neoliberalism? There's no such thing as society, Thatcher taught us. There's only the individual and of course the benevolent state looking after our best interests. Of course, what these models lack is community and support networks. By these, I mean the close relations we build that help us achieve success and that give us support when we fail. For those of us without well-connected and wealthy parents, we must assemble our own groups through shared hobbies, work colleagues, neighbors, the occasional person you meet on Tinder, but then you realize you're just better off as mates. These are the people who coach us through the moments of self-doubt, who hold us when, we, when everything just feels awful who show us how beautiful life is in our darkest and grayest days. These are those who collectively work together towards a better quality of life, not for the richest, but for all of us. And that's the collective spirit that truly makes a successful artist or academic. We've all been raised on the myth of the lone genius painting in glorious isolation. In the film world, we're taught of the auteur, the genius, who may be misunderstood, but finally the people will understand and reward them. And so it's this optimistic uh, you know, thinking that, that I will be discovered at one point. In fact, solitary success is a lie. To succeed, you must be enabled by multiple people. 
And so uh, with this, I'm, I'm thinking back to all of my projects. When I left behind that fear of failure, when I was able to build teams such as that film in Berlin and uh, the, the collective group that we built through the wardrobe with, that was our key to success. So just a wee conclusion here. I want to return now to the immersive proto me the, the immersive media prototypes uh, that I mentioned at the start. Here we are nearly two years later and the successful projects have been making the rounds at all the big festivals. But what happened to the failed prototypes? How have the lessons been archived so that future makers can learn from their experience? There is undoubtedly a legacy in the skills that were acquired and the lessons that they learned that they can carry over into new projects. When the immersive media and creative technology industries talk about stability, they usually imply financial stability as in growth, you know, companies that can carry on and do bigger and better things. But what if rather than just assembling people who have produced groundbreaking, mind-blowing projects, instead you hire people who have failed because they bring with them a body of knowledge of things that don't work. We don't just learn from sharing successes, we actually learn from sharing our failures. So with that, it's something of, of, of a plea to be able to have an openness of failure, to be able to share these things with each other and to be able to learn from each other. And that only through that can we subvert this sense of, of individualism and individual success and individual failure and actually pull it together as a collective endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. That was fantastic. Uh, we've got loads of questions coming in and plenty of comments too. Uh, the, the first comment of all, uh, off topic, but Rob looks fabulous. So, <laughs> uh, well done on that. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, perspective of uh, an immigrant having to create your own form of stability. So moving. Uh, lots of great feedback on through the wardrobe. Sounds like we've got a few people who um, got to experience that. So the first question I'm going to ask is from, uh, I'm going to say Zante Queen. I may not be pronouncing that correctly. Um, do you know of a mainstream example of something which began as a failure and grew into something because of it? Uh, I would imagine many famous pieces of art began as happy accidents. Mm. Oh, a mainstream project began as a failure. Um, I don't know. Anyone else have, have any suggestions? Any, anyone in, in the chat want to offer up uh, any, any solutions? Um, I mean, I, I love examples of, uh, of films that um, were kind of condemned by the studios. Um, something like, like Shrek. I think I was looking at something yesterday that was saying that um, with Shrek, that was like, it was a punishment in DreamWorks. Um, that if you had uh, failed in some other part of, of the company, you, you were shrekt. Um, you, were, you, you had to work uh, on that and that, that was a punishment. Um, and yet it ended up being you know, one of the most successful um, uh, films of all time and uh, or animated films of, of all time. And you know, it as a film celebrates failure. It celebrates not fitting in. It celebrates not being accepted. So I think the, the, the subject matter of the film is actually quite apt to how it was, it was actually made and how it began as a, as a failure project. Great. Uh, another question from Isaac Pomerantz-Trift. Uh, who are your favorite queer artists at the moment? And how do you think they'll help you continue in your artistic ventures or even limit you in either way, depending? Yeah. Um, ooh, favorite queer artists. Um, I mean, it, it depends on, on kind of what, what you consider to be um, an artist, because I, I see so many great um, filmmakers out there. I've, I've been watching, I've been in, in a lot of queer film festivals uh, this year, watching a lot of great queer films, and I'm seeing a lot of amazing stuff coming from Brazil. Um, there's, a, there's a filmmaker, I can't remember his name now, um, but he made this film called Dry Wind, um, and it was probably my favorite film of the year, I would say. Um, and yeah, it's so there's there's some really 
fantastic stuff coming out of Brazil. And I, and I wonder if it's part of a culture of resistance um, as well. Um, so I, I'm finding a lot of inspiration actually from finding other artists like that who are coming from, um, from, a, from a sense of kind of not trying to make uh, wholesome, lovable, likable films. Um, you know, very unapologetically queer projects that are not maybe made for the mainstream. Um, so yeah, I would I'd highly recommend the film. Uh, I think it's called Vento Seco is, 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 the, is the name in, in Portuguese, Dry Wind. Great, thank you. So I wanted to ask a, a question of my own. Uh, you uh, gave a little shout out there to sort of hacker culture and thank you for this. Um, but then you, you also sort of, you know, you produce work which relies on sort of the other end of the technology spectrum. You held up a HoloLens there. Those things are not cheap um, and they're certainly not hackable. Uh, how, how do you feel about that sort of binary and working on either side of it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this, this is actually, this is from UE. So this, this is the, the university. So um, yes, I borrowed that. And uh, I was, um, yeah, I, I mean, I was able to uh, hire rent, you know, kind of different, uh, the, these headsets and all that. Um, but actually, you know, it was, we were sort of able to, to push this, uh, this headset to, to its limits. We were able to, to hack it a little bit. Um, it's more to me using, especially kind of off the shelf technology like this, it's more about flipping it on its head and thinking about how can we use it differently? Not just the way that it's meant to be used. And, and sometimes that results in a lot of frustrations. Uh, it certainly did with this. Our first iteration of Through the Wardrobe, uh, this thing froze up uh, multiple, multiple times. It didn't really work properly, but we learned through just failing again and again and again and again. Um, and we, we were able to, to pinpoint how to make this work for us rather than, than us sort of just working working for, for this and making it work as, as usual. Um, yeah, we, we kind of, we turned it around and, and tried to figure out ways for it to tell the story that we wanted it to, to tell. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Xanthe Queen. Uh, I know you've recommended a few uh, pieces of text about creating through failure throughout this, but which are your favorites and where can we read them? Text. Um, yeah, so uh, Cruising Utopia, um, Jose Esteban Munoz. Um, there was um, uh, Barbara, Barbara Ehrenreich's uh, Bright Sided um, from 2009. I think this is also from 2009. There is uh, The Queer Art of Failure, which of course is, is I kind of use for my main, um, my main structure. Um, that's Jack Halberstam. Um, I mean, I'm not encouraging you, but they are. Uh, there are PDFs um, out there on on a few different places. Uh, Zed Library, um, I've heard, is a good place for you to find PDFs of these books. Watershed um, does not condone any such no. things, it's, but 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 it's important to be well, aware of what's going on in the world. Exactly. Um, okay, um, another talk. Another question here from uh, Meg H Houghton Gilmore. Uh, such an amazing talk, Rob. Often, I often feel paralyzed by fear of failure. Is there anything you can do as a sort of daily practice to overcome this? Um, I, to, to me, it's about building up a community um, because that fear of failure is very much an, an, uh, an individual fear that you where you often feel like you're the only one. I mean, I, I had that, you know, when I was talking about when I was, um, when I found sort of lost my way in London, um, that I felt very much alone and it was very easy to be alone. You know, London was, is a very, can be a very isolating place if you don't build up your network. And it was really hard for me to build up a network of other filmmakers that I could count on. And I think, you know, coming to Bristol, um, having, you know, the, the privilege of at least a monthly stipend for my PhD. That's given me a lot of um, you know, reassurance that I didn't have to worry about paying the rent. But I think being here, I've been able to, to build up a community of queerdos and weirdos and artists and academics. And I think through that, really being able to, to feel inspired. Um, the last you know, three and a half years that I've been in Bristol have been prolific for me creating things because I have people around me that 
uh, you know, especially days when are, they're really tough, where I am paralyzed by, by the fear of failure or where something really is just objectively failing, that there, there are people that, um, that I can go to, at least now for a virtual hug. Um, but yeah, back, back in the good old days when we could actually sit together, um, you know, when, when I was in, the, I was in the, the Bristol VR lab, for example, for, for a little while, and having someone like Verity McIntosh, who sat across from me, um, just that, that, reassure, that, that presence of reassurance um, just kind of made me feel on really tough days, like, you know, hey, it's going to be okay. And I could just kind of, I could, I could talk to her about certain things and, and kind of talk through things. And so I think having someone like Verity, if you can find your own Verities, people who sit around you while, while, you're, while you're working, that you can bounce ideas off of, and it, it goes both ways. Um, I think that's really the key to getting over that, that paralyzing fear of failure. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Zante Queen. Um, where has it gone? Oh, just, uh, yes. What, what are your thoughts on drag shows other than the mainstream and almost more societally fitting shows? Uh, for yeah. example, Dragula, Drag SOS. Yes. yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's. I think these are um, these are much needed. And um, here in Bristol, hopefully, you know, we can actually get back in into pubs. There's um, there's Slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouse uh, celebrates this this kind of this dark, very very gothy uh, drag, um, weird drag. I love that that sort of weird drag, um, especially as we've been taught about high fashion drag and. You know, super high femme and, and perfection drag. It's really nice to have places uh, like that that celebrate the weird. Um, there was there's also um, someone who I I knew up in Manchester, um, uh, Cheddar Gorgeous, uh, who is uh, one of the 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 best most original drag queens I know of certainly in, in the UK. Who is a bit of an alien, and uh, for them. Drag goes beyond just gender play. It's playing with with different species, and and you can go beyond uh, just trying to to fem up um, to to become all sorts of, of creatures. So I think drag, especially a really weird, creative uh, drag like that, can go uh, can go you know as far as you want to push it. Um, but yeah, I personally I, I I don't look to something like RuPaul's Drag Race for uh, for the most positive example, to be honest. That's great. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. So if anyone wants to get them into the chat now, that would be good. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, though. Um, in sort of embracing failure, are you not sort of reinforcing this idea of success and failure as a binary? Mm -hmm. And would we be better off just throwing away the whole concept? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I, I think what I'm, what I'm calling for here is, is even though I'm using the words failure and, and success, it's really about a reevaluation, um, even of what we consider a failure. Um, and, and really, I mean, I, I, undermining su success um, or undermining the, 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 often the commercial metrics uh, of, of success. I've used them here as, as sort of a, as a straw man argument, shall we say, um, because the, this is often our societal um, frame of what is success and failure. And uh, even, though I'm, even though I'm using that language, I'm, I'm very much trying to advocate for a subverting and flipping on, on its head um, this idea of what is failure and what, what is success. Maybe we just need a new language. You know, it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, in, in Through the Wardrobe, where we're looking at um, kind of non-binary terms and how does the English language adapt to, uh, to new gender diversity uh, ex expression? You know, how, how do we, uh, you know, neo pronouns and, and these kinds of things. How do we react? How do we adapt? Um, and, I, and I think maybe we need that for success and failure. Um, if we kind of take that non-binary queer uh, model and apply that to success and failure, maybe we can come up with a better language for it. Great, thanks. And I guess one last question. What's next for you, Rob? What are you working on now? Where, where, what's your next failure we can look forward to? Oh, uh, oof! Uh, my PhD thesis. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of uh, tapping away at that. Um, done. I'm 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 editing it at the moment, so I'll be turning that in. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be around in Bristol for for a bit longer, and then and then we'll see. 
you know, at this point, um, you know, after the PhD ends, I'll be kind of looking for, for opportunities anywhere, to be honest. Um, I do, I have uh, an installation that we've been working on. We, we got some R&D funding for, it's called the Velt. Um, and it takes your presence and the color of your clothing and it turns that into music. Um, I've been working with, with an amazing coder composer, Marcus Dyer uh, on this. And so whenever we can get back, you know, in venues and, and, and things like that, um, we'll be able to, to share that installation. But that's, that's something it's been really lovely to work on uh, through, through lockdown. Um, it's something that is um, hopefully not, not a failure, but it's, it's certainly, it's, it's, it's something that, um, uh, where, where I hope you can kind of go in and actually relax. You know, it's, it's really quite a, a relaxing project. And I, and I think I just really needed that right now, uh, a project that's, that's just kind of fun to get my mind off of the thesis and everything else in the world. Right. Uh, I think we've got one last question, which is just oh. snuck in under the wire uh, from uh, Wu Tan. Uh, hi, Rob. Have you developed a conscious ability that a conscious ability to know that you're about to fail, I think it's the question. Uh, absolutely not. Um, I think I, I still very much, um, uh, I, I, you know, as, as someone who was born and raised in America, I, I definitely am uh, in that kind of cult of optimism that Barbara Ehrenreich is, uh, writes about. Um, this, this hope that, that things will, will get better, that this time it will succeed. And I think sometimes holding on onto that hope is um, that can be a, a form of, of um, a psychological trick, um, a form of, of, of survival um, as, as a maker. Um, and yeah, in the back of my mind, the, the whole time I'm definitely thinking this might be a failure, but I think this is where the whole talk actually, you know, where this, this idea that even if, if this project does fail in commercial terms, if it, if it fails at prototype stage, if it doesn't make it to, uh, to uh, an exhibition, to a film festival, whatever, the fact that that time that I spent working on it is not a failure. The fact that that has actually um, been, uh, there's been a lot to learn from all the, the pain and the tears and, and, and all of that. Um, and it's kind of, it's incorporating that into my, my future practice. I'm not, that's not easy. I'm not trying to romanticize that. Um, I'm just saying that, um, that yeah, as if, if I feel like something is failing or will, will fail, um, it's kind of, it's also not entirely forgetting um, the, the lessons that I learned from that. Great. And uh, finally, is there anywhere people can find your work online? Um, I'm, I'm working on a, on a website at the moment. It's not polished yet, but you can, you can look on it. It's, it's uh, robeagle.art. Um, and I'm also on Twitter at rob underscore eagle underscore. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Rob. It's been an absolute joy to have you on. Um, and yes, some absolutely fascinating ideas. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, before you go, next week's talk is by studio resident Sharon Clark, the creative director of Raucous. Uh, she'll be talking about how the pandemic has changed how we think of theatre, some of the ideas that Raucous has been testing, and how this is going to influence the work they make in the future. And you can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to the newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel uh, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share this link. The captioned version of the video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you here again next week.